thank you to you all for coming. I know that um, several or many people have travelled quite some distance to get here today. And, it, and it's wonderful to see that you've been prepared to do that. It's something that needs to happen because if we don't get off our bottoms and get out and do things, nothing is going to happen. But well done for all of you for, for coming. What is today about? I think it's very simple. I think that why we're here is because we realise that something is very badly wrong with our country. We can also say we know something is very badly wrong in Europe. And we're trying to do something about it. And there are lots of people at the moment working very hard to do something about it. But I believe that a key weapon we must never lose sight of is simply the truth. The closer we get to the truth about what is actually causing the malaise, the illness that we see in this country and in other countries, the closer we get to that truth, the easier it will be for us to fight it. And I think for a number of years we've unfortunately been in the position where people have been trying to fight an enemy they don't quite understand, an enemy that they can't quite see. And therefore that enemy always has the advantage. What I perceive is starting to happen now is that truth is beginning to come up to the surface. And I believe that our two speakers today are going to help us get closer to the truth and therefore we will be able to go away better equipped to fight. <coughs> so, as well as these overt things which Horst has taken us through, which he can see, and obviously people in Germany can see, there's another element of it at work, and it's a work inside this country, because we ought to be shouting to each other about this. It ought to be front page of the Telegraph, and it's not. And there's obviously a reason why it's not. So I'm just going to leave you with that thought, and now we can ask Edward if he'll bring the discussion back inside the UK, and he's going to talk about the power of the EU, the NHS, and Parliament here. So we'll move from Germany to the UK. Thank you. Thank you. we've heard from Horst concerns a political class which has a very clear idea of where its country's interests lie. And this leads to a foreign policy which is pursued very consistently and vigorously whichever party or coalition is in power. Now, whilst we may see the dangers in the course chosen by Germany's elites, we can at least understand it. I'm sure that the people carrying out these policies genuinely believe that they're serving their country's best interests. But they make the wrong assumption when they expect other countries always to remain quiescent whilst Germany increases its power. And to persuade them differently, we need a self-confident country here with a clear idea of what its own interests are. And what I wonder is the grand vision of our political class. Uh -huh. I find it impossible to say. The, co the consensus of the leaderships of all the main parties appear to be to subordinate our national government and our constitution to the interests of a group of foreign powers at enormous expense and no benefit, and to subordinate the deployment of our armed forces to the policies of the United States at a great cost of blood and treasure, again to no discernible benefit. I'm not sure whether the microphone's working or no. it needs to be a bit closer. Hello? Hello? Right. Sorry. Uh, that's that better. Um, yes. So, as Mr. Blair goes on his merry way tap dancing across the world stage, it seems he always needs a soldier's chorus to, uh, uh, to assist him. And how on earth did we get into this state? And how has a country which once produced statesmen with vision come to be run by such a grubby, undistinguished and politically indistinguishable crew of whatever party they are. I believe it arises from the increasing culture of deceit by all parties since we joined the EU, where they persuaded people that we were simply going into a trade agreement and uh, that nothing much else was affected. 
And even people who have not thought things through and shown the interest such as this audience has know that something is wrong with rotten at the centre of the top. It used to be that people looked upon a parliamentary seat as a great honour. And it was the type of thing which people would go in for after a successful career elsewhere. But now it is a career in a discredited and dishonoured profession. Well, what can we do about it? We know that some MPs and politicians are honourable men and women. What can they do to avoid being tarred with the same brush? And I'm going to combine this theme with another matter in which we all have an interest. That is the National Health Service. Not many people have yet made the connection between what is happening there and the European Union as the regulations and directives are driving the process of privatisation. I can assure you from about 10 years experience that many of the EU's most determined opponents are socialists and trade unionists. I'm not a socialist myself, but I've worked with them and they are splendid campaigners. As with political parties, the leadership of the trade unions became very pro-EU and they drive their programme forward regardless of their members' wishes. But that is changing. Uh, the membership is making its views felt and last year, the, e, the uh, sorry, the previous year to that, uh, the uh, TUC passed a motion opposing the European Constitution against the wishes of the leaderships of many of the unions. I'm including the NHS because it is a cause which concerns us all. We all rely on it at some stage in our lives. And as one of my comrades in the Labour movement said when I first met him, you may not like us, but if you mean to win, you need us. And there are seven million of our fellow countrymen and women in the trade union movement and I think that the, the uh, NHS is a cause which is close to their, uh, their hearts. <coughs> Every day seems to bring some new story concerning the breakup of the NHS, and it's really been making me increasingly angry, because hospitals are soon going to be required to advertise in competition with each other. What a wicked waste of resources. We all care about this health service and rely on it for ourselves and our families, and it is one front in the broader fight. And I take it that we're all intending to win this fight. And being angry is quite a good way of getting you motivated to start, but it's a bad counsellor for strategy and policy for winning. We don't just want to hold meetings which make us feel better. As the Americans say, we don't want to get, just get mad, we want to get even as well. Back in October, I was in Parliament talking to some MPs of independent mind, and it was the same day that a petition was delivered to Parliament with four million signatures concerning the similar breakup and privatisation of the post office. The central lobby was full of thousands of people there, all lobbying their MPs about this. And the little group I was talking to, I thought, I'll stir it up a bit. I said, how many of your colleagues, do you suppose, have said to these petitioners, sorry, there's nothing I can do about that, it's all decided by EU directives now. And these men looked a little sheepish and said, well, they didn't suppose that anybody had said that, but they had to admit that that was indeed the case. Something similar to what's happening to the NHS is happening throughout all our public services. The Inland Revenue, believe it or not, has sold all its offices and now leases them back from a company based in a tax haven. You couldn't make it up, really. <laughs> the private finance initiative all sounds rather complicated, so let's compare it with something many of us have done, and that is getting a roof over our heads. You go to the bank or building society that offers you the best, cheapest rate for a mortgage, don't you? Well, when the government borrows money, if it borrows it money for itself directly from people and firms, it can always borrow at the cheapest rate because it has all our taxes as security. So why do they go to private financiers who themselves will have to pay a higher rate uh, of interest and then charge yet a higher rate on top of that to leave them a profit? And the margins are enormous. On one large hospital contract which was providing 
for eight billion uh, pounds worth of hospital buildings, it was worked out that the charges over the life of the contract would be 53 billion. It's enormously more expensive. It is as if you went not to a bank or a building society to raise money for your house, but to some backstreet money lender, uh, and, uh, who would not only charge you a great deal more, but you'd still end up owning the house at the end of the 20 or 30 year contract. Yet this, this is what the government has done. And why has it done it? Because they're not by and large stupid people. Peter Mandelson didn't choose to finance his flat that way, did he? Yeah. He, uh, he borrowed 300,000 off his friend Robinson, the paymaster general, and went and got a mortgage for the rest of it. Well, the reason that the government is going for this PFI project is quite simple when you think about it. When the Conservative government signed up to the Maastricht Treaty, it signed up to all the stages concerned with the European, the Euro currency, except the actual changeover of notes and coins. So amongst these was the Stability and Growth Pact, which limits the government's borrowing to 3% of, uh, of gross domestic product. But if the money is borrowed by private individuals, it doesn't figure on the government's books. Now, you may remember that Enron got into some difficult trouble by doing finance after this sort. And again, it's not surprising to know that the government <coughs> frequently uses the same firm of accountants that Enron did. <laughs> so, and uh, some of their directors were sent to jail for over 20 years. Now, you see, we've often heard health workers and doctors being very eloquent about what is happening to the services which they provide. And it occurred to me that they, in fact, were describing the symptoms of what is happening. But it takes people like us with some political insight to actually diagnose the cause of a disease. That it is a political disease which requires a political cure. And we have a remedy available. A sovereign remedy, uh, which is Parliament. Parliament, no Parliament can bind its successor. And this has been the source of Parliament's power to adapt and change as the country and society changed. This was the power itself which created the National Health Service. If I may, I'm just pausing very briefly, but we, we've run out of tape and we would like to capture your words because they're so good. So if I can just ask... Certainly. If Fern uh, will... T tell me when you're... When you went with. <laughs> I haven't got my glasses. I can't I see what I'm doing. <laughs> Sorcerer's Apprentice here. Brian, since you are going to make the tea, I have to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly. Did anybody say, or did I get it wrong, that Germany has said in so many words, not specifically in this eight words, that if we don't comply with what they want, they're going to fight us physically? Did I hear that all the time? Jenny's highlighting is the Bertelsmann, and we've just heard from Horst about the Bertelsmann Foundation, which is driving strategic European policy from obviously a totally pro German angle. That Bertelsmann is now providing the public services for the East Riding of Yorkshire. And I tested this out on Wednesday, uh, Tuesday last week, or oh, sorry, this week just gone by phoning up East Riding and having a little chat with the girl and asking if she knew anything about Bertelsmann and in particular the Nazi connections. Well, she didn't want to talk very much. And eventually I said, 
oh, are you Bertelsmann? And she had to admit she was. So basically, when you speak to East Riding of Yorkshire, and if you want to talk about social security matters, or personal matters, or family matters, or monetary matters, you are actually speaking now to part of the German group that is driving the strategic German policy in Eastern Europe. This is incredible. Now the other thing I had here, which I think is pertinent to what has been talked about, we've heard the strategic side, we've heard the national side. A gentleman sent me on Thursday an email, and I'd like to read it to you, it's very short. Today I attended a day seminar at the former cinema in North Hants, supposedly about funding and running voluntary organisations. It was run by the East Midlands Regional Assembly, North Hants County Council, East North Hants District Council, the local health authority and an organisation called Connections. The waffle was truly something to behold. I represented a chess club, a secretary and treasurer. treasurer. The various PowerPoint presentations were a waffle of pseudo-Marxist prattle. However, please follow carefully the line of thought and the usage of words. Discussions, he discussion headings were as follows. The word or phrase triggered verbal diarrhoea, leaving one wondering exactly where the meeting was going. We are, remember, a country rural area, a very small market town, with a population of 6,000, not an urban conurbation. And here are the topics that all of these charities were brought together to discuss. Regional government, core spatial strategy, spatial investment strategy, growth area funding, regeneration work, initial stages, big picture, key partners, new developments, sustainable growth, voluntary groups, statu statutory and voluntary groups, North North Hats Development Company, a new urban regeneration company, regional government representation, deliver services, huge population growth forecast, additional growth funding, increasing socialisation, statutory sector, voluntary sector, add extra value, commission going forward, commission services, destabilise. At this meeting, they openly discussed the start of the phase to destabilise the local government of this country. And this email for me says that the strategic plan that we're hearing through the national plan is now moving down to the local level very, very quickly. And presumably if you're lucky enough to live in the North Riding of Yorkshire, with respect, we now have a major German company of highly suspect politics running the show. I'll leave the rest to your imagination. You might be interested to know the curious use of the word spatial, and it comes from the German Raum, meaning as in Lebensraum. Raum Ordnung is the, uh, is the uh, German for what they call spatial development here. What does that mean? It's, it's large scale planning decisions, basically. Um, just a question, really. Um, I've spent a lot of time on the web, great website, uh, looking at various sites. I um, spent 10 years in Canada. So I'm quite interested in looking at North American websites. And I find quite a few, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I find quite a few of the um, words that you've just read out appear in North America, not only in Europe. Does this imply that there's something going on at a much higher level than just Europe and North America, which is perhaps controlled, or is that just a conspiracy theory on my part? So you have to answer that question. Okay. 
useful to make a comment on it. I'll read out basically the, the words and the phrases that I use there. Um, David is saying that he's seen the same thing mirrored in, uh, in America. And therefore, is there something bigger than just what's happening in Europe? Do you think there's more to it than just Europe? I don't know how, um, how matters are going in uh, America. I'm <clears throat> not, knowing, uh, not knowing much about it, but um, I think um, we should, uh, we should uh, look how things are going here. Um, regarding me, I think I should look how things are going in Germany. Uh, which uh, influence is uh, um, exerted by, by, by Germany. And um, it may be that uh, similar phenomen phenomena uh, are, um, you, you can find similar phenomena uh, in other places on the world. But um, my primary theme is what's happening here, where I'm living. Uh, just a quick, quick one on, on, on that. Um, it, it's rather interesting to look at the parliamentary website here and you find there's a surprising number of MPs belong to the Association for World Government. So, uh, and doubtless a lot of their opposite numbers in America belong to something similar as well. So, very popular. Mm. Um, right, I, I'm going to try and restrict, restrict the questions for coffee, but we've certainly got time for two. Gentlemen in the blue shirt. I, I can show. You sure? Okay, yeah. um, my name is David Wilkins, and I work for a think tank in Estonia. And I, I want to really ask uh, Mr. Spolton something. I'm, I'm working towards an opinion myself, and I want really to ask pe people's feeling on this. And it's about the whole thinking of BDI and what we, as Eurosceptics, should do at the next election. I'm convinced that Eurosceptics, as a movement, should act aggressively as a swing vote. And we should demand of the um, likely next government, two main parties, we should demand a price for our votes. And to think like that rather than something else. Now, we've made an incredible hash of things in getting David Cameron as leader of the Conservative Party. There's a lot of newspaper stories and lots of stories, stories have all heard of people saying similar thinking to PDI that we do not like what you are not saying about Europe therefore we may not vote for you and, and this, is, this is the crazy idea I want to ask your opinion on I believe David Cameron is several months ahead of us on this and several months ahead of our protests threatening to vote UKIP and the mathematics is simple. If there's two people in an election, say for argument's sake, Cameron and Brown, if you don't vote for Cameron, or anyone else, but then transfer your vote to Gordon Brown, Cameron is down one and Brown is up one. The difference is two votes. But if you just say, I don't like you, Dave, I'm going to stay at home, withhold my vote, Vote UKIP, vote BNP, whatever. Cameron is only down one vote. The difference is only one. But as we know, Cameron's strategy is to attract former Labour and Liberal Democrat voters. Now that means for every sort of fluffy centre ground guy he can attract, Brown is down one vote, he's up one vote. That means he's only got to attract fluffy lefties at half the rate, he loses his core support to stay even. Okay. If, if Cameron has thought that, which maybe he has, what is our reaction? And this is my question. The only sensible thing to do, and we're going back to Enoch Powell now, is vote Labour. If, and this is what I want to ask you, could we, as an organised, aggressive swing vote, say we will vote Labour if, and the if is EU constitution, no matter how many it is, referendum, or, or what, and that's what I'd like to ask. 
Thank you, that's very interesting. I do know of one constituency where a disgruntled group of Conservatives did exactly as you suggested. It was a marginal constituency. Uh, they had some, their, their 200 votes became, as you said, effectively 400 votes, and that was enough to keep out the, uh, the MP that they, had, that they had got, who had let them down badly after talking Eurosceptic, but voting for the Maastricht Treaty and never making a, uh, a, a, a comment about it. So that can be done under the right circumstances and in the right constituency. It's not going, I think it's, it depends on several things. It depends on the constituency and what the size of the majority is. It depends uh, also on the personality and the commitment of the, uh, of, the, um, uh, of the candidates. I mean, personally, I would vote Labour or Conservative if, if the uh, candidate had, uh, had signed up to this, to, to the BDI. Uh, and and that's, that, that, that is one of the strengths of it, because it, it is doing exactly as you suggest. Right. Right. I know that you're going to keen to answer questions, and I'm going to do the cruel thing. That is that I think we should break and have a cup of tea, because a lot of people have travelled, and I detect some dry throats. If we can save 15 minutes, we'll see how the throughput goes, or for a cup of tea. Obviously our speakers are here, and I'm sure they're be happy to, to talk with you, and then when we resume, we'll go for some nice formal questions, and perhaps we can pick up a bit on that last one. I would like to very quickly ask a question uh, regarding Angela Merkel's stated uh, big uh, drive in her presidency, which is, of course, to reproduce the Constitution. Uh, now, the reason I ask this is because, if you remember, when Giscard and his convention finalised the Constitution and they announced it with the great fanfare, one of the rules attached to it was that within two years of the Constitution being signed by heads of states, it would have to be ratified That's right. That's right. by 20 countries and they hope that they're not more than 20. Well, the two, the, 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 the heads of state signed on the 29th of October, 2004. On the 29th of October, 2006, only 18 states had ratified. So by the rules drawn up by Giscard and his convention, that constitution had failed. It was dead. It was kaput. It was exactly like that, cut. So by what rights, by what enormity is anyone even talking about resurrecting it? It really means they should go back to the Rahman Accord when the whole thing started, which they never took any notes on the first place, and start again. Do you agree? Yeah, well, that's right. For um, it, uh, you, you can't say what uh, the um, um, the jurisprudence will decide before uh, they did it, but um, it's from the point of view of the German politicians, uh, the government politicians, difficult to um, think that. Um, Problems that might be result from the EU constitution could not be used, um, they could, could not be uh, solved. Um, that means um, <coughs> I think uh, this um, differences between the EU constitution and the national constitution will be solved in any way by uh, I don't know by, by, by uh, how they will manage it, but. I'm sure they will try to manage it, manage it and I think uh, they will uh, succeed. Do you want to come in? Uh, <coughs> yes, I, I heard about this. And there was a, at the time of the Maastricht Treaty, there was something uh, similar cropped up. And it was rather odd because 
they waited for the results from the uh, uh, from the uh, Constitutional Court, and the court seemed to have considered uh, a treaty of its own imagination. It said yes, therefore it's all right. But it wasn't the actual treaty that had been signed, so it will get through one way or another, I'm sure. Cost <laughs> here today. Uh, do you uh, put this message across in Germany yourself, or uh, if you do, are, is your message being well received, or uh, is it being uh, ignored largely? See what I have to say. This, uh, uh, this um, position uh, towards uh, German foreign policy and the EU is uh, surely is a minority position in Germany. <clears throat> uh, you can't find uh, ideas like that in the main, mainstream media. You can <coughs> find it in the internet where we have a, a, a known website um, where we um, um, publish our um, analysis. But it's a uh, um, clear minority position. Horst, uh, when you go home, can you form a new battle for Germany group? And on the placard outside the door, say it's twinned with a new battle for Britain group. <laughs> <laughs> Just with, a, with the aim of getting the dis discussion livened up a bit, is it my imagination or are we hearing a story of lies and deceit and propaganda? Is that, is that what we're hearing or not? Okay, I just wonder, we'll see. Uh, Dr. Lister, uh, 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 Jenny, and then there's two gentlemen at the back and then back to, to Jenny. Uh, 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 gentleman here with the yellow suit. Uh, all right, ladies first. Uh, Jenny, all right, Jenny. My question is quite brief. I believe many people in this room have been trying to get out of this monster for very many years. Have you any idea of how we can get out? Any other suggestions? Right. <laughs> Where to? <laughs> I think I've made one modest suggestion during the course of my speech, which I commend to you, um, because I think it is important that if we possibly can, we do this through our own institutions, which must mean Parliament. Um, however, even somebody, such a long-standing parliamentarian as Lord Stoddart of Swindon, who's our chairman in the campaign for independent Britain, has said in private conversation that he thinks that this will, if we, if we don't get out that way, then uh, we shall have to get out by other means. So, yes, let's just keep on until the, 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 they'll, they'll get tired before we do. Do you want to get out that one? How to get out? Mm -hmm. I, I think uh, there are enough Germans who, who <coughs> have ideas what uh, British people should do. <laughs> I don't uh, like to um, put in another suggestion to. <laughs> <laughs> Will you permit me as chairman to reply a uh, view on, on the question, what we do? Mm -hmm. Go on, yeah. is that okay? Well, I believe that what is happening is not political, it's politico-military. We are being attacked and the weapon is propaganda, it's infiltration, it's subversion, it's gentle destruction of the country. And there's a lot of documentation that proves this. It sets it out. Now, once you've got used to the idea this country is being attacked, you have to start thinking differently about what you do. But one of the things I will say to you is everybody keeps looking to the top of the UK pyramid for the solution, but that is exactly where it is infiltrated the heaviest. The power lies at the bottom with ordinary people. And what we have been doing as a new Battle of Britain group is very simple. We've been getting out there and telling people the truth. 
we're using the words about fascism and traitors and we're telling them that it's very serious and we're telling local councillors that they're traitors and we're telling our local politicians these are the words we're using you are liars and they cannot stand up to it they are crumbling one by one and this is something which isn't happening enough people are producing papers they are writing to their local MPs but the local MPs won't act so what we need to do is go for the bottom the other thing is that the other side is attempting to do two things simultaneously one it is attempting to put a control structure in place which will control everything and everybody totally because that is a totalitarian state and the other thing it's working to do is to destabilize the country to produce blood on the streets because when there is blood on the streets in will come the European police force and you have lost what we need to do is destabilize faster than they can put the control structure in place so we should be attacking everything that's bad and we are doing it in one area Plymouth it is producing phenomenal results we're shortly going to have similar things going in Bristol and Birmingham. May I pick up on Edward's suggestion of writing to MPs, please? In the last four and a half years, I have written 180 letters to local councillors, MPs, shadow ministers, ministers, the Prime Minister, the Speaker, and the Queen. Of the letters to the MP, 58 of them, only 14 have even been acknowledged. Only 14 have even been acknowledged. So it's a good suggestion, Edward, but I'm not getting any success at all with my efforts. 180 letters, I totted them up before this meeting, to all manner of people, party leaders, you name it. If they answer at all, it's letters from minions. They don't deal with points. They ignore them. Mm -hmm. Letters to local papers and national papers, very limited success. What, what was your subject of the letters? Very many subjects. For example, writing to the MP last June, Mrs. Christchurch's MP, pointing out that MPs have then recently voted themselves to fill the black hole in their pension fund mm. from the public purse. And I said, wouldn't it be nice if all those who fund the public purse could fill the black holes in their pension funds from it? And did he think that was appropriate? He has an answer. <laughs> <laughs> I asked him a, a question in writing, which was asked at my last Christopher meeting, Choke. conservative branch chairman, and I'm not in it anymore. What is the point, from the Conservative Party's point of view, of Britain being in the EU? What Please tell us are the advantages. His answer verbatim was, I'm not going to get to that now. <laughs> and I have written to him and written to him, but he will not answer the letters. Uh, could I just make a quick uh, adjunct to that? A very quick one. There's a gentleman waiting. Is there a reply there or not? Uh, let's go to Peter first. Just go to Peter. We'll come back to it. Uh, it's a bit nearer, we're just... The battery's running out. Keep it close to your mouth. Very close. The battery's running out. Yeah, all right. Yeah, right. Nobody should be surprised at what you are saying. Because two countries of Europe have in fact voted against the Constitution. And what notice have been taken? None. None whatsoever. They plough on regardless. So that if you or I or anybody else writes, are they going to take the slightest notice? No, they are not. And sadly, the truth is, until we have a national campaign, not 50 people in Marlborough, until we have a national campaign where MPs feel their jobs at risk, success will not reward our efforts. I actually said that in a letter to the MP. You were watching your own impending redundancy. This is the beauty of the BDI in that it does put their 
careers on the lines. We don't want political careers, most of us. We'd like to have MPs who are actually members of a real parliament. Uh, and uh, say, yes, we'll support you if you do that. And if we can get sufficient people signing up on our website to be able to say, there's 1,200 votes in your constituency pledged on this. That'll can, make a difference. Do you know whether the people who wrote that book, Direct Democracy, are they BDR members? No. None of them? Or no, I, 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 we, we run BDI with a very small committee, but there's three of us. Uh, there's myself, Rodney Atkinson, and Lynn Riley, who were the originators, and I give them a hand. Th th those are the only, th and apart from that, we don't have members, we have supporters. Peter, Peter, uh, was it John and then Derek? Is it? Hello, get it close. Will you? Yeah, that's the thing then. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> yes, this is um, just a brief point uh, as a follow up to the. Uh, comments and observations of the gentleman there about the lack of uh, concern, accountability or interplay between our elected representatives and, and members of the public. Um, I've taken a particular interest in the uh, workings of our legal system and I know hundreds of people who uh, have had a an astonishing and, and frightening experience of, of corruption within the legal profession. Uh, and hundreds, thousands, have written to the Lord Chief Justice, people at the pinnacle of the law, Mr. Blair, the Queen, etc., and they are hardly ever uh, replied to. Uh, and in fact, uh, we understand, I mean, Lord Wolfe was written to a lot, but we were told that letters were screened by his um, sidekicks uh, and he never get, got to see instances of outright corruption. The final point is the legal profession have acquired from themselves a, um, a clause in the uh, workings of the courts whereby if somebody proves to be what they call a vexatious litigant, uh, i.e. makes life embarrassing for them, they can impose what's called a Section 42 uh, declaration on them, whereby they can never again take anything uh, to a court. So it, it's quite an arbitrary um, uh, silencing mechanism. Thank you very much, Peter. And then John. Okay. John, <coughs> John Ryan. Dare I suggest that we're tiptoeing around the problem about what to do. Pressure groups, and there are an infinite number of them around the country, pressure groups have achieved nothing, or virtually nothing so far. There is only one way, well there are two ways we can change what's going on. One is through a revolution, or secondly is through the ballot box. And in the ballot box it does mean voting for someone who is against the European Union. Uh, just as an aside, I tackled Michael Ankrum on this subject a year or two ago, uh, where he made some remark and I told him that in my opinion it was his party that led us into this mess. And you might be amused by his reply, which was, we all make mistakes, don't we? <laughs> um, I think we've got to face reality. There is beginning to be seen a crumbling of, 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 of some of the people, more senior people in the Conservative Party. We've seen two members of the House of Lords defect. We've recently seen an increasing number of councillors at local level defecting. And I'm just, am I wrong? But the only way we're going to change it is by putting the fear of God up the established parties that they may lose their jobs. Fear, fear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Derek over there. Derek, you Derek. There's a gentleman here by I just uh, concur with what's just been said, but one of the problems, everybody in this room wants to get out of Europe and have proper democracy re-established in this country so that we can control our own destinies. Uh, there are several organisations all with that, the same view. There's UKIP, there's the Campaign for Independent Britain, you've got the BDI, you've got the sort of Bank of Britain, the democracy movement. They've all got the same ultimate goal. Uh, and they're very small, each of them, but together 
they might be far more effective. And I would suggest that at least the leaders of these groups might talk together to find where they have common ground and how they can have a common policy <coughs> to achieve their ends. Uh, and furthermore, <coughs> I think that in this day and age, the real results come from exposure on television in particular. And it's very interesting as to why the media do not want to pick up this issue. And one suspects that they're infiltrated at the top too. I mean, I think some people thought that the rumours of world domination were a fiction. And Ian Fleming is supposed to be a fiction writer. Perhaps you need James Bond. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, I couldn't agree. I couldn't agree with that more personally. Um, it's it's been evident for some time that the all of the action groups are going off and doing their things, but they're not talking to each other and they're not benefiting from successes in other areas. Yes, we would do more than what Mould was doing. Is we're not a competition. We're not in competition with anybody else. Um, we. Welcome, all parties, all bodies. Um, the option. Hold it back. Sorry? Hold it back. Yeah, hold it back yourself. Yeah, you can speak across the top. Uh, well, there's more models all over the country. That would be better. You've got to do it on a local level, bring the people together. You will not do it through the central offices of these various bodies, but you can do it in Swindon, you can do it in Yeovil, you can do it in Plymouth, as our friends are doing it. Get them together in some form, get them through working on together, then you can do something. That's what you've got to do. There's only two groups in the country at the moment, one in London and one here, that actually is coming together. Uh, uh, sorry? It was a cough. Well, you've got a business. That's my point. Yeah. 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 Yes, I think that if you look, for instance, at Norway, they have their, an umbrella group, No to the EU, which covers all all parties. Um, the nearest thing I suppose we've got to that in this country is the Campaign for an Independent Britain, which includes uh, organisations, it includes representatives from UKIP, it includes representatives from the Labour and Trade Union movement, it includes Conservatives. Uh, so that is fairly uh, all embracing. But in fact, these groups can be made to work together pretty well as long as you've got personal confidence between the individuals concerned. Um, but in the last year, I know that uh, there was an attempt to bring together an alliance of all groups, and the interest in it was virtually zero. It must be on the local level. Yeah. It must be on the local level. That's the only answer. Oh, Margaret now. Margaret Carroll. Jones asked me to come to the front. OK, <laughs> Uh, well, this is, these are my, this is my own opinion. What I feel we need is a revolution. Hopefully not a bloody one, but a quiet revolution. I think, uh, first of all, Vladimir Bukowski said when he was sent up by Stalin when he was uh, arguing against a totalitarian state in Russia and he was sent up to Siberia, put in a gulag in a mental hospital, injected with truth drugs, he said, oh, sorry, he said... Uh, they were short of medical supplies and he said to, to the people there look blokes, there are 2,000 of us uh, they've only got 12 punishment cells they can only put 12 of us away uh, we'll all go let's all go on hunger strike so they did and they got their uh, medical supplies um, he also said that when Margaret Thatcher introduced the poll tax uh, 3,000 people uh, objected to paying didn't pay, and it caused chaos in the system for years. So if they can do things like that, I'm quite sure that we could do it. And I suggest that we get together and encourage people to refuse to pay either their council tax, to, I personally, I'm not going to let inspectors into my house under no circumstances, and I am hopefully going to refuse to have an ID card. Although I know that that does penalise you because they can go and take you, stop you from going into the bank, stop you from going abroad, do all sorts of things to you. Uh, I, when I was standing outside the um, Dur the uh, Durley Inn in Bournemouth uh, during one of the uh, election campaigns, Sir John Butterfield went in, and I 
thought, I'm not going to shake hands with him. Anyway, then I thought better of it, and I thought, no, I should do, and I should tackle him. So I did. So I stopped him, and I said, um, uh, Mr. Butterfield, would you please tell me what right you have to take my freedom, my democracy, uh, my country away from me? And, uh, and I said a few other things as well. And he said, do you really feel like that? As if to say, my God, nobody's ever spoken to me like this before. Do people in Britain really feel like you? I said, yes, about 80% of us feel the way I do. And, and what you're doing is absolutely outrageous. You've no right to do it. And neither have all the, your, your companions. Uh, I've also had a letter from the Home Office saying that they were coming to in, interview in other words, interrogate me. Uh, I was so angry that I did a very foolish thing. I just wrote across the top. And they said they were going to send two men to interview me that I couldn't refuse because my house had been chosen. I couldn't refuse to, um, uh, to answer their questions. And I thought, no way am I answering their questions. So I just wrote across the top in big red letters, uh, I will not uh, be interviewed. I will not submit to being bullied. And what I should like to know is where and when are you going to erect your first concentration camp? And I posted it back to them. Yes, I'd be more than interested, sir, to... To learn your success in Plymouth, we in Woking have organised meetings, have circularised every single house in the town, a population of approaching 80,000, and between 30 and 70 people have turned up. Have you any constructive thoughts, I'm sure you have, on generating some interest in the future for their children? in the supine, <laughs> unbelievably stupid population that we have at the moment who are far more interested in watching who wants to be a millionaire than their own freedom. It is apathy which is there, which is our enemy's trump card, isn't it? Yes. Have you any thoughts how we can overcome this apathy? Yes. I mean, I look around here, I don't see any young faces. I don't know how how it was publicised locally. Well, youngish, yes. <laughs> I'll, I'll say young. Sorry, Big yeah. I didn't notice. <laughs> but we are all of a near enough, you know, upper generations. It's absolutely appalling in my opinion. But there we are. There's a question there somewhere. <laughs> for, for some reason, the Eurosceptic movement on mainland Europe attracts many more young people than uh, we see at meet our meetings here. Um, I was in Austria uh, last year uh, for a, a meeting of the team, which was the uh, organization of the, uh, for want of a better word, Eurosceptic organizations. And there were young people from Norway, and a very, very active movement now in Switzerland. Norway? Norway, yes. Do they I, need to be there? They, they do, because they want to, they want to stay out. Uh, and we also had young people from Switzerland there, um, and they are being extremely active and seem to be enjoying themselves doing it as well. Could you get them to come over here? <laughs> I, I, I said to, uh, to, to, uh, to uh, my colleagues, I said, if we could get some of those Norwegian girls across, we'd have a very red button fail. Have they got Big Brother over there? Have they got Big Brother over there? I'd like to just mention a few things, if you don't mind. Thank you. I know where my mouth is. First of all, I'm fairly young to the gentleman who said he didn't see too many young faces here. What I will say to you, what I've found recently, and yes, I am a counsellor, we do hear an awful lot about spatial strategy, and that is your opportunity when you have all local meetings that you can attend as public to voice your opinion. And that is where you start to lobby. You cannot light a fire from the top. You have to start it underneath and fuel it. You find that if you go to some of the local school group meetings, some will bring up the fact about education being at an all-time low, why there are cuts. You bring it all back to political correctness and EU. 
and that is where you start your lobbying. There is a terrific group of women, and I have to say on a hands-up basis here, I have been to it. This was prior to my leaving the Tory group just this week. But it's called Winning the Vote with... I did actually find out my true friends when I left the Tory group. And the nice thing is, it's a case of we were waiting to see what you were doing and then we want to come with you. I find that rather sad because it means they are the unspoken people. The amount of letters that I received after the bad publicity last year are the quiet people. They're too frightened to speak out. And I think it's somewhat worrying that we have groups of educated people. I think we're all educated in this room because we're here and we want to hear what we can do. And the only way you're going to do it is to lobby. So, you're back to scratch, aren't you? Talk to the people who have come up to you and said, oh, I think you're right after all, and just start talking about it lightly. You will find they will come back to you and ask a few more questions. I actually have people coming into my shop now on a regular basis saying, I haven't come in to buy, I just want to say, you were right. And I find that very encouraging. So you have to spread the word. The thing I'm concerned about in the main is that it's very much a case of the thought police are listening in and that is what makes people very, um, um, very aware of being careful how they say it, where they say it. And that's the bit we have to break down. I stood up for a local councillor this week. You may have seen me on BBC Points West, you may not. You may have heard me on Radio Wiltshire Sound. And my words were, it has come to a stage where people are too afraid to speak to each other publicly in case they are overheard and misunderstood. Call a racist. Absolutely, was I not the whole time. I'm not a racist, I just want what's right. I heard what you said, and the answer to the lady is the bottom line. Get together with your friends. Every meeting you go to, wait for a point where you can break into that <coughs> conversation. And the gentleman has given it to us this afternoon. Health is one of them, transport is another. Just go through the list, you will find a reason to state your case. Thank you. I feel, I feel bad now to put in the <laughs> camera at me. <laughs> I, I wanted to ask a question, but I have been asked to speak about, um, about Norwegian girls. Um, <laughs> a room full of people a little bit older than themselves and without understanding what the speakers were going to talk about or anything else they just say I'm in the wrong place this is not people like me and that's only reasonable when you're young you do things in different ways it's very old fashioned to come to meetings like this people nowadays they get um, viral communication through the internet and all those modern gizmos you know now if you want young people to be involved they ain't going to get involved in a big meeting of pensioners. It's not how it is. <laughs> now, talking of action now, I'm going to ask you to put your money where your mouth is. Because democracy movement, um, young lad Stuart Costa, who, okay, he himself's not as young as he used to be. This summer, they've got a project, and they're trying to get it off the ground, and very few people understand it. They want to bring over some people from Norway, Estonia, um, Lukash's people from uh, Switzerland, and people like that. And what they want to do is get a, a little minibus, go to auction and get an old post office Sherpa or something like that, which is going to cost them about a thousand quid. They've already got sponsorship for the insurance and fiddled a few other things. And then they need a budget. And they need a budget for beer and diesel. Right? Because if you're young and you're invited to come along on a trip around the country to support um, the kind of campaigning, high street campaigning, giving out leaflets, this kind of thing, you pitch up with um, a dozen youngsters from all over Europe. They have fun and it challenges all the stereotypes that are levelled against us. You're no longer a bunch of geriatric, xenophobic old codgers. 
you're suddenly a transgenerational, internationalist bunch of people with a vision for the future. It's different. The democracy movement's budget that they're trying to raise for this project is only about £4,000. And that's to buy an old bang with a minibus, put some fuel in it over the months, and a few other things. It's not a lot. But what it needs is maybe older people who've got a bit of the money that younger people haven't got, is to say, OK, I'll part sponsor that. I'm, I'm good for a hundred quid, or I'm good for 500 quid, and then stay well away from it so you only see young faces. Okay, that, that's my suggestion for action. gently got onto the subject of the EU and they've said well we're not really interested 
And I said, so you're not interested if people die? And they said, what do you mean? And I say, well, the EU is very vicious and people are going to die. And they say, why? And I say, because it's a police state. They say, why? And I say, well, do you know where it comes from? Because it's got a history in the Nazi party. I've now got at least 15 young people questioning me on a daily basis about what I know. All I've done is what a number of people in parties repeatedly told me I couldn't do, and that is to tell the truth. This newspaper is telling the truth. Inside, it asks whether it would be better to hang Blair or put him in prison. <laughs> this is the language we need to use, because these people need to be frightened. I'm not frightened. We need to frighten them. Gary Streeter, Conservative MP, in writing, is effectively pro-European. That makes him a traitor, because we've just heard from this, gen this, uh, this gentleman what the EU really is. We need to use the language, and the language is, at the bottom level, fraud, corruption, lies, deceit, and it is fed by European money. At a higher level, we use the same language to our politicians. If they are not actively working to get this country out of Europe, they are traitors. It doesn't matter whether they're Conservatives, Labour, Lib Dem, UKIP, or BNP. If they are not doing it, they're traitors. Yeah, yeah. And if I may suggest, sir, that in your letters in the future, see what happens when you actually call them a liar or a traitor. I believe you'll get a response. <laughs> The Horst's talk will be uh, published on the Free Nations website. The, uh, if you'd like to make a note of, of, the, of this, it's www.freenations.freeuk.com and it'll be on there on Wednesday, I think. So, uh, well, if anybody, if anybody wants to uh, a copy of what I've got to say, I will be... Please do email it to them. If you would just email me a request, that's e.spalton, S P A L T O N, at btopenworld.com. And I'll send you a copy. Oh, yes. Uh, you can um, uh, also have a look at uh, www.german-foreign-policy.com. Uh, that's uh, a website uh, I'm working with. Uh, where you can find uh, more information on German foreign policy, even uh, also in English. Not, not all texts are um, published in English, but uh, a part of them. www.german-foreign-policy.com Come to me if you, if you, if you want it. Oh, I, I've got it. Okay. just like to make some observations on... Uh, um, the blood in the street scenario, which is an attempt to bring in the uh, Europol and uh, so-called restore order and, and, and then put, put us uh, completely un under the heel of uh, the EU. Um, the uh, one observation about uh, terrorism is that um, why is it that we always see the terrorists go after soft targets? They go after the public. They don't actually go for strategic targets. If it was a genuine operation, if it was really um, a, a genuine assault, it would be against strategic targets such as communications and um, power infrastructure and uh, the uh, organisational um, uh, operating of, of, say, blowing up town halls and things like that. But we don't see it. All we see is soft targets. People are injured, hurt, maimed, damaged, traumatised, but it doesn't affect the running of the country according to the way that the, the, the government of our lords of misrule seek to operate. So I, I raise that as an observation, and I just wonder whether um, either of our uh, esteemed speakers would like to make a comment on this. Thank you. That's a uh, difficult question. Um, I think uh, you have um, um, offences against um, um, soft targets. Soft targets. Um, 
in Iraq, for example, or in Afghanistan. So um, you have uh, the same uh, the same sort of, um, uh, of um, terrorism um, there in uh, the areas where I think it's uh, real terrorism. Uh, I don't um, work much about these phenomena, so I don't. Uh, I should add better not say much about it because it's not really founded. Um, yes, um, about three years ago, I visited a remote country house in Lincolnshire, which was the headquarters of a firm that makes sublethal. Uh, armaments for security forces and they showed us quite a few things they got some knockout drops of spray that if they got into people's eyes it would put them unconscious for 20 minutes they had uh, a new type of uh, round which would replace the baton rounds or the plastic bullets that they used to get used in Northern Ireland it was a thing like a rather like a tea bag with a little streamer onto it it was fired out of a shotgun and 50 yards you could aim could hit somebody's elbow or something or whatever, knock them over. Uh, and business was obviously booming. Uh, uh, so uh, I think that the authorities are tooling up for government against the people. Yes. Right. I'm watching the time, so Dave, I think we can say last one, please. Okay, Dave. Yes, I think you've hit on a very, very interesting point there. That the, um, but so we see the occasional terrorist incident like we did in London and 9 11 and so forth, soft, soft targets. Uh, I've never really realised it before, but, but we see every sort of month or so uh, the Home Office Minister or the Home Secretary getting up and saying there's going to be a terrorist incident, a terrorist incident over Christmas, it never happens. But the whole idea is to keep people on the on edge scared and afraid, and please give us ID cards, please give us DNA testing so we can keep these people uh, at bay. Um, now there's one other thing that strikes me is your friend Lee, uh, Brian, down in Plymouth, uh, he has mentioned that he did a uh, thesis when he was at university on the Badr Minoff guns. Uh, apparently um, the uh, German government Perhaps you couldn't quite stand to be corrected on this. Used the Bad Minor uh, terrorism uh, 20 years ago, was it? Yeah. To induce the German people to accept ID cards and, and some control of their liberties. Uh, I've only got his word for that. I don't know whether you have anything to uh, add or suggest to that. Perhaps you don't know about it. some laws through. Um, they already had uh, in, in their working desks, at their working desks. But um, I also think um, they were well, fear that they wouldn't be able to control um, the, this, um, this gang um, that it uh, would uh, get out of control. I think it's both. It's not only the one side, but um, uh, of course uh, they some put just, some justification. Not not only justification, uh, also um, justification. But I think uh, they had a real fear then. It's just past five o'clock, so I think we should um, finish the questions there. Um, I think we can sum up a little bit, and I should try to do that. If I'm getting it wrong, you'll let me know. Um, but essentially, for me, what I've heard firsthand from a German, the story in Germany, is that it's not good. In fact, it's really not good. And this is not 
idle politics. This is very serious manoeuvring strategically to take over countries and certainly to take over UK because we're always a problem. And therefore I'm going to go away tonight thinking that what we are really dealing with is, is a new form of fascism. In fact, the socialism is in there somewhere. And we've heard from this side that basically the problems in this country and that hospitals in particular are being attacked. It's interesting that one of the most vulnerable places in our society, which is where we look after our sick and elderly and infirm, as one lady in Plymouth who works in Derriford Hospital said, I am watching the hospital destroyed. And I believe she's correct. So I think that what these two gentlemen have really done is brought home that the overall situation is very, very serious. Now, because you're good people, I should smile or something, because you're good people, you've also come up with some suggestions. I've picked up a few and I'll recap. Somebody mentioned that we need a revolution. I might agree with that, but revolution is a dangerous word because at the moment it can put you in prison. So I think I jumped into that one with both feet, and of course you're right. But the, the sentiment is there. We need to get out and really go for it. We need to be aggressive. We need to tackle these people who are traitors. We need to get out of the ballot box. And politicians, and particularly the MPs, are amazingly cocky. They are isolated, insulated from the world. But when you suggest to them that you're going to go do some active leafleting in their constituency to prove they're traitors, they seem to go all wobbly, and that's what you need to do. I would suggest that 500 leaflets in an MP's constituency saying that the man is a traitor and betraying his country because will get more action than 500 letters directly to the man. We need a common policy, I'm always worried about that, of people working together, and I think this is a very good idea We've got all of these movements, even if they can't integrate, and I don't think that's good anyway. We should work to get them to act together. Lady Councillor has suggested that we need to deal with the local issues, and we in Plymouth would agree with that because when we've been providing the evidence of fraud and corruption, there, there are ructions at the moment within inside the Labour Council, and we are now being given information by councillors who are, are wanting to do something about it. The democracy movement <coughs> is suggesting we should do more for young people, and in principle I think that is a good one, um, but I also learnt that young people, if you talk to them sensibly, are amazingly sensible. Try telling them that they're going to die. We need to publish the truth, we can do it. The printing presses have not yet been stopped. And the only thing stopping us printing the truth at the moment is the fact that people are not producing the right articles. And one of the things that Robert Francis has kindly offered to do is help filter information from these sorts of people so that we can turn it into news articles. BBC is rotten. The BBC last year, I'm sorry but you know me by now, from last year till now has spent £47,000 on Common Purpose. And if you don't know what Common Purpose is yet, you will do because it's going to rule you. And the last thing is, is terrorism designed to make us frightened and afraid? And I believe the answer to that is yes. And I can say to you as an ex-military person, I have absolutely no belief in either Al-Qaeda or any other of the terrorist threats put against us. Lastly, I would say one point, nobody has mentioned the Muslim community in this country. In early December, I went and gave a talk in Birmingham Central Mosque. The talk was on the EU. I 
I said to them that they needed to understand that they were being lined up to be the new Jews in UK. And I said that unless they understood the threat from the EU, they were going to die. And that's the words I used. Since I gave that talk, I have now got groups calling me, wanting to know more about what we're doing, saying that they want to get rid of the Labour MPs who they regard as corrupt, they want to put forward independence, and they have also assisted the Battle of Britain in Plymouth. Now, there are activists out there who are dangerous in the same way that there are animal rights people who are dangerous, but if you fall into the trap of believing the threat is the British Muslim community, you are falling into the fourth rights trap. We need to work with these people. Okay, thank you for that. We have a raffle. Would you like to select the first winning number? Can I make one suggestion when you go away from here? When you talk to people, say, I went to a meeting where two gentlemen said that what was coming was... He um, stood up in the House of Commons and he actually explained that Al-Qaeda doesn't exist. What, uh, what it means, Al-Qaeda means the base. And uh, it originates from a computer system which was set up in Saudi Arabia in the late 80s, uh, which was um, a very, very uh, secure, secret um, communication system, which was a, um, a spin-off from a, sis a computer system which was put in for a, a banking organization which had, then had a lot of spare capacity. And so a lot of organizations, Arab organizations, were, were using this secure form of communication um, for exchanging um, um, sensitive information. And it was known as the base, which is the, the term Al-Qaeda. Now, um, Robin Cook explained this in Parliament um, not very long before his untimely death. And it does raise suspicions about his death. But... Um, this is something which um, further, I mean, you, I mean you, you pick up a newspaper and most days there's something about an Al-Qaeda threat. But um, this is something that perhaps should be publicised more um, to, to, to um, pour scorn and rubbish <coughs> the fact that the, 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 um, the government of the day are trying to um, tell us that, they, this, that this is the, the, the structure and the form of, of the terrorist threat. But in actual fact, the structure and the form of the terrorist threat is quite different because it, it is controlled and emanates from our Lords of Misrule. Thank you. Can I, can I just ask whether you'll give a round of applause, please, for um, both Robert Francis and Harry, who have kept this operation going here in the Source much of their lawmaking responsibilities to outside bodies. 80% or more of the laws and regulations which are binding on us are now made in the EU, and Parliament is a rubber stamp. This is why the party leaderships are all huddling on the so called centre ground of politics. It's the place the EU allows them to be. Now, if I were an MP and had given away most of the power to make law, I would probably want to keep quiet about it too as the MPs did with their petitioners on the post office. In the real world, when a job is outsourced, people lose their jobs, don't they? But there are MPs from the main parties who want to do a real job in a real parliament, answerable to us and not to foreign institutions in Brussels and Frankfurt.
trouble is that there are also MPs who say that they want to do this, but vote the other way once they get into Parliament. We have devised now not a mere campaign, but a tool to finish the job of restoring national sovereignty. It's a weapon in the hands of the honest and a pitiless exposure of the frauds and cheats who want to do only part of the job of making the nation's laws whilst drawing a full salary and a princely pension. It exposes the hypocrites who claim to want democratic sovereignty when seeking election, but do the opposite in Parliament. It's called the British Declaration of Independence, and it is open to candidates of those parties already represented in Parliament. It forces MPs and candidates to act by linking your votes at a general election to a specific act of Parliament which will reassert the sovereignty of the people, enabling the reinstatement of public control over our affairs, including sound public finance and control over the NHS. It's called the British Declaration of Independence. It bypasses the party leaderships, although the, the MPs will remain Labour Party or Liberal Party or Conservatives. It bypasses the party leadership on this constitutional question and puts you back in charge. It allows those who want a democratic self-governing nation to know for certain which candidates are willing to commit themselves in writing to doing this. And it demands a candidate's signature and on pain of resignation, a specific commitment to voting for a constitutional bill before Parliament, which, when passed, will immediately restore our democratic rights as a nation. Candidates who refuse to sign are saying that they want full pay for doing less than half a job, leaving decisions on matters like public finance, through the growth, Stability and Growth Pact, to foreign bankers and officials with no responsibility whatever to you. Throughout this Parliament, we will be asking MPs to sign up to their true employers, that is you, the people. MPs from both main parties have already signed. They promise their electors irrevocably, irrevocably, that's important, to vote for the British Declaration of Independence Bill when the time is right and also to vote against any bill which explicitly or impliedly repeals any of the principles in the Declaration. We will be talking to your MP one way or another. To, we ask you to register your support on the BDI website. Your name and address will be kept confidential, but your postcode shows which constituency you're in. By this means, we can say to candidates, look how many votes there are in this for you. This can be very significant in marginal seats. If you're not on the internet, you can write in to the address on the leaflet. We also ask you to write, phone or visit your MP to say that you will only support a candidate at the next election who is signed up through the BDI to do an honest job of work on behalf of you, his employer, without bending to the will of any foreign institutions. The pledge contained in the BDI is a weapon in the hands of the candidate in the election and in the hands of the elected MP afterwards. If the whip supply pressure for him to vote away more powers, he can say, fine, I promise my electors I will resign rather than do that. We can have a by-election on the issue. This puts everything in the right order. The people in charge of the MP, the MPs in charge of the government, and the whip gets his proper job, which is to take the bad news to Downing Street. So, please remember, there are just two things we want you to do. Register your support on the website and tell your friends about it. And make sure your MP knows that you will only vote for a candidate who is a BDI signatory. This is the only way to make sure of a final victory in getting back a real parliament and so a really sovereign and independent country.